So open to 1 Corinthians 15. The subject of this morning's message will be our resurrection body. And I've titled it, From Dust to Glory. From Dust to Glory. Last time, we looked at the teaching of both the Old and New Testaments, that though a man may die, he shall live again. The teaching of the Bible is clear that just as Christ rose from the dead, all who are in Christ shall rise also. And the Apostle Paul has explained this to the Christians in Corinth. He told them, of course, you must believe the gospel that Jesus died for our sins and rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. We must hold fast to that message. And he also told them back in chapter 12, and he said this in Galatians 3 as well, where he speaks about how Christians are baptized into Christ Jesus. So before we begin chapter 15, I want to uh, clarify something. So we're all aware going into this of this difference, uh, the difference between the spiritual resurrection so to speak, and the physical resurrection. When you placed your faith in Christ, when the Holy Spirit came to dwell within you, you were, in a very real sense, resurrected spiritually. You were dead in trespasses and sins. But the Holy Spirit of God raised your dead spirit to life. So that, we could say, is a spiritual resurrection. That is the born-again experience. But of course, Christians still live in this mortal body, and Christians still die physically. But the good news of the gospel is not only a spiritual rebirth, it is a physical resurrection. Uh, this is the subject Paul is dealing with in 1 Corinthians 15. So with all of that said, let's begin in verse 29. Paul basically is... <clears throat> correcting those who claim that there is no resurrection from the dead. And he's saying, basically, if that is true, then otherwise, what will they do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead do not rise at all, why then are they baptized for the dead? And why do we stand in jeopardy every hour? I affirm by the boasting in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. If in the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is it to me? If the dead do not rise, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Awake to righteousness and do not sin, for some do not have the knowledge of God, and I speak this to your shame. So there's three points I want to address at the beginning. Uh, point number one, this issue of baptism for the dead. If you ask any informed Christian about baptism for the dead, they're going to tell you that is an unscriptural practice. And yet the Bible mentions it here, so we'll address that. Point number two, Paul is basically saying, if there's no life after death, then hey, might as well just go out and have fun and live it up because there's, there's nothing else. And then number three, uh, Christians need to be on guard because evil company does corrupt good habits. Okay, uh, first, the subject of baptism for the dead. Many of you are probably aware that this is a practice within the Mormon church. How many of you are aware of that? Or we say the Mormon church, the official name is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And they practice baptism for the dead by proxy. Basically, the idea is if uh, a person, maybe a loved one or anybody, if they were not a believer and if they were never baptized, someone else can be baptized for that person to help get that person into heaven. So they baptize for the dead. If there's one thing we know for certain, that is not what Paul is teaching. Uh, that is, he is not endorsing that. He is not encouraging that. 
at, at the most, he would be making reference to the fact that that could be happening, and most commentators are not even sure about that. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on this. There's several ways the baptism for the dead can be interpreted. But you know what? It really doesn't even matter because, number one, nobody knows for sure what he's referring to. And second, it wouldn't matter anyways, because the larger point is, if the dead do not rise, then what you're doing is useless. It has no meaning. That's his point. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, Paul's pointing out that his ministry would be pointless. All Christian ministry would be pointless if the dead do not rise. Why was Paul risking his life? Every single day. Wherever Paul went, as someone said, wherever Paul went, either a revival broke out or a riot broke out. And that's pretty accurate. Why would Paul risk his life if there is no life after death? You might as well go out and eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you're just going to die. And obviously there were some corrupt people in the church who were a, a bad influence on others who probably lived that way. And that leads us to our third point. Evil company, and you know this, don't you? Evil company corrupts good habits. You know, I think it's part of the job of a, a preacher is to tell people what they don't want to hear. You see, the, the Christian church used to understand the doctrine of separation. That yes, we are in the world, but we are not to be of the world. We are to be holy. Christians are to be a holy, set-apart people, different from everyone else. The church used to understand this doctrine of separation. If somebody preaches on this today, usually they are called a legalist. So we are in the world, but we are not of the world. That is true. But here's the thing, when a Christian hangs around with, spends a lot of time with, becomes good friends with an unbeliever, one of two things will happen. Either that Christian is trying to lead that unbeliever to Christ, or the unbeliever is trying to lead the Christian away from Christ. And all too often, it's the latter. Paul says, do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. And then he continues in verse 35, but someone will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Foolish one, uh, what you sow is not made alive until it dies. And what you sow, you do not sow that body that shall be, but mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain, but God gives it a body as he pleases. And to each seed its own body. He says, all flesh is not the same. There is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of animals, another of fish, and another of birds. There is also celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differs from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. All right, let's turn to John chapter 20. We want to find out more about the resurrection body. And Paul addresses what I think is a reasonable question. I know he responds by saying foolish ones. So he apparently thought it was foolish, but uh, for most people, they don't know. It seems like a reasonable question regarding the resurrection. The question is, how are the dead raised and with what body do they come? Is it the same body? Is it different? Then he sets forth an example from nature. He talks about a seed. When a seed is planted, what happens? It dies, it decomposes, but God has designed that seed that from the death comes life. It's really amazing when you think about it. We take it for granted. This, this is just what happens, but God designed it that way. Another illustration that might be helpful, and I know this isn't a, a death or a resurrection, but consider the monarch caterpillar. 
and you look at it and the metamorphosis that it goes through and it ends up as this butterfly, how does that even happen? On one hand, there is continuity. It's the same creature, but it is radically different. The resurrection of the dead will be, I believe, similar. So what will our resurrection body be like? You want to know this, don't you? Don't you want to know the way you're going to be for forever? Remember, Jesus is the first fruits. That's what the scripture calls him, the first fruits. His resurrection body, think of it as a type of prototype. His body is like a prototype of what ours will be like. I pointed out last week in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, it says that when Christ is revealed, we shall be like him. So here in John 20, Jesus had been crucified buried then mary visits the tomb three days later and finds it empty look at verse 11 but mary stood outside by the tomb weeping and as she wept she stooped down and looked into the tomb and she saw two angels sitting uh, in white sitting on one on the head and the other at the feet where the body of jesus had lain then they said to her woman why are you weeping and she said to them, because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. And when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Of course, he knew. She, supposing him to be the gardener, which is interesting, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. So we see here Jesus is there in his resurrection body. And Mary knew Jesus very well. But she looks right at him, and she doesn't know it's Jesus. And then when he speaks to her, she probably looks again and then realizes it's him. So what do we see? We see that our new body, our resurrection body, at least to some degree, will look different than the body we have now. Hey, that's good news for some of us, okay? Amen. <laughs> amen. Can we get an amen on that? Look at verse 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. So the second thing we see about the resurrection body, it will be a spiritual body. Now I want you to stay with me on this, okay? In 1 Corinthians 15, 44, Paul says, It is raised a spiritual body. So obviously a body that's purely physical like ours at the moment, cannot walk through walls or appear and then disappear. And this is what Jesus did. All of a sudden, here they are in this room, the doors are shut, doors are locked, all of a sudden, he's there. And then there are times where all of a sudden, he's gone. In a split second, he could be one place and then another. So it is a spiritual body. It will not have the limits that our body has now. And someone could hear that and they say, so we'll be, we'll be a spirit. We'll be like a ghost then. Well, not exactly. Look at John 20, 26. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them. And Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, peace to you. And then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here. And look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And this is when Thomas makes that great confession of faith that Jesus is his Lord and his God. But notice what he says. Look at my hands. Reach your hand here and put it into my side. Jesus also told his disciples in Luke 24, 39, he said, behold, my hands and my feet. He said, handle me. 
and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. So the third thing we see is that the resurrection body, while it is a spiritual body in nature, it is also physical. Now don't ask me to explain that. It's raised a spiritual body, and then Jesus says, well, handle me, a spirit does not have flesh and bone as you see I have. So we're talking about the miraculous here. Uh, you can't explain a miracle. And I'm not sure we could understand this even if the Lord did explain it to us. So what do we learn? The resurrection body will look different. It's the same, but it's different. But Jesus still had the nail prints in his hands. So that's number one. Number two, the resurrection body is a spiritual body. And then number three, the resurrection body has physicality to it. Uh, this would appear to be, what? A contradiction, right? It looks like a contradiction, but you know what a paradox is, right? A paradox is a, an apparent contradiction. The word paradox is defined in the dictionary this way, a statement or proposition that seems self-contradictory or absurd, but in reality expresses a possible truth. Every Christian needs to understand that just because you don't get it doesn't make it untrue. Just because it seems impossible doesn't mean it can't happen. With God, what does the scripture say? All things are possible. Good. So go back to 1 Corinthians 15. You know, some amazing truths, I believe, about the resurrection body. And I don't mean to sound... Uh, flippant about this, but the resurrection body, it just sounds cool. I don't know about you. It just sounds really cool. Can't we just get that resurrection body right now? You know, and I say that because there will be a generation of Christians who all of a sudden in the twinkling of an eye, guess what? They get that resurrection body at the event known as the rapture of the church, which Paul mentions, just skip ahead to verse 51. Paul makes reference to this, 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, that is, we shall not all die, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. This is the Christian's blessed hope. The return of Christ the rapture, the resurrection of the dead. Paul writes in Titus chapter 2, verse 13, that Christians should be looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And again, if a person doesn't have this hope, if a person doesn't have this hope of the resurrection, what are they going to do? They are going to resort to the philosophy of life that says, Eat, drink, be merry, for tomorrow you die. And this is what people are doing today. Seeking after material things, fun, pleasure, drunkenness, sex, whatever it is, in an attempt to distract themselves from the knowledge that they know that death is always one day closer. Christians, on the other hand, can look at it completely different. We can look at that same thing and say eternal Bliss is one day closer. In verses 38 through 41, Paul speaks of how the Lord in creation created different types of flesh. Mankind, animals, fish, birds. And they're all different, aren't they? And so are the heavenly bodies different. The sun, the moon, the stars are all different. And his point is the resurrection body is going to be different also. Look at verse 32 or 42 again. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. He says there is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. And the last Adam, which we know is Christ, became a life-giving spirit. However, Paul says, the spiritual is not first, but the natural. And then afterward, 
the spiritual. So again, I've titled this message uh, From Dust to Glory because that's what's being described here, from dust to glory. Man was created from what? The dust, the dust of the earth. And Adam and all of us, we have that physical, natural body, a body of dust, as it were. But we are going to be, if we are in Christ, raised a spiritual glorified body. How many of you have been to a Christian graveside service and you have heard the minister or maybe a priest say something to the effect of ashes to ashes, dust to dust? You, you've been there. You've seen that. Mm, here's the thing about that, okay? <laughs> it likely originates from the Bible. The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3, Solomon says this. He says, all are from dust, and all return to dust. So then it's biblical, right? Well, here's the thing about Solomon in Ecclesiastes. He is often expressing a negative and cynical viewpoint on life. I mean, the whole book is about life without God. Vanity. All is vanity. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity, says the preacher. I mean, this is negative. It's cynical. Right before that statement, dust to dust, Solomon says this, that man has no advantage over the animals, for all is vanity. Is that true? No. I don't think so. So, you know, it's true to the extent that we are all made from dust and uh, we all die and return to dust. I mean, there is truth in that, but the hope of the resurrection is not dust to dust. It is dust to glory. Genesis 2, 7 says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So what did God do? He created the first man, Adam, out of the dust. And naturally, we are all sons and daughters of Adam. So in Adam, we all die. This is what Paul is referring to in verse 47. Look at it again. He says, the first man was of the earth, made of dust. There's not much hope there. But the second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. I don't think I've ever at a graveside said dust to dust, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Here's what I quote, okay? And if somebody does the other, that's up to them. That's, that's fine. Here's what I quote, verse 49. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. That sounds a lot more hopeful, so I, I prefer that. So right now in this life, right now, we are more like Adam. But in the life to come, we will be like Christ. Paul says in verse 50, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. I think his point is, nobody gets to heaven like this. You will never get to heaven the way you are now. And that's good news as well, because if we got to heaven like this, heaven would not be heaven. So we have to go through that metamorphosis, if you will. Look at verse 51. Again, he says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. That is, we shall not all die, but we shall all be changed. In the New Testament, the word mystery, when it is used, is referring to something that was previously unknown. A new doctrine here. This is big. A new doctrine that the Lord gave to the Apostle Paul. Elsewhere, Paul mentions that he did not receive his doctrine from men. He was not taught by flesh and blood. He did not receive these words from the other apostles. Paul was given direct revelation by God himself, by Christ himself. So here he is laying out this new glorious truth, not only about the resurrection. That's not new. People knew about the resurrection. So what's the mystery? It can't be the resurrection. 
That's not a mystery. People already know that. What's the new truth? The new idea, the mystery, is that there will be a generation of Christians that never die. They will get their resurrection body without having to go through death. What does the scripture say? It is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. But there's an exception, an exception that proves the rule. Uh, more details can be found in the parallel passage of 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. But Paul says here, starting in verse 52, it says, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. What's Paul doing here? He's trying to encourage and give hope to the believers in Corinth and to you this morning, I believe. He says, for when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. He says, O oh death, where is your sting? O oh Hades, or the grave, where is your victory? When does this happen? At the coming of the Lord, the last day, the end of the age, the rapture. We don't know when it's going to happen, but we are assured that it will happen. And as we said last week, death has not only been conquered, death one day, the scripture says in Revelation 20, that death itself will be cast into the lake of fire. Paul says in verse 56, the sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen, amen. to that? So in conclusion, I think this is Paul's conclusion. And he's moving into chapter 16, and this will close the letter. But he gives this exhortation to the church. And I believe this is the exhortation that we need this morning. What does he say in verse 58? Therefore, here's his conclusion. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Father, how grateful we are that Jesus Christ has conquered death. He said, no man takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord. And I have power to lay it down. And I have power to take it up again. And may the Holy Spirit of God take this message and strengthen us and help all who believe to be both steadfast and immovable. Strengthen our faith daily, and by thy grace, if the Lord does not return, bring us back here again next week. It's in the powerful name of Jesus that we pray.